Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing on Romilly Street in Soho W1. A few doors north of the loo irradiated for life by Russia's most incompetent spies. Two doors east of Dennis Nilsson's favorite pub. And within sight of the restaurant, where the daily special included a dose of death. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Snug between Old Compton Street and Shaspi Avenue, Romilly Street is a soulless void. Being nothing more than a dirty back street, riddled with the ramshackle rear ends of some very questionable restaurants, you won't see a shop but you may see a gang of rats roughing up a one-legged pigeon. Two crack addicts playing backgammon using their displaced teeth. And a stained speckled chef keeping his filthy hands warm by ferreting about in his back garden and then fondling his trouser vegetables. But oddly, it was and still is a place where people come to find good food. At 21 Romilly Street currently stands Gaultier, a highbrow vegan restaurant run by award-winning chef Alexis Gaultier. And back in the 1960s, it was also an Indian restaurant called Taj Mahal. As an Indian eatery catering to bland British tastes, the staff at the Taj Mahal were well used to a little spice in their day whether being whinged at by the half-wittery of has-beens who start of his sentence with the words I'm not a racist, but or a spew of yobos scoffing napalm-flavoured vindaloo to impress their pals as on a regular basis the staff are threatened, attacked, spat at, abused and robbed. On Saturday the 22nd of June 1968 a petty thief tried to steal a small amount of cash from Taj Mahal. It wasn't a daring heist, but a petulant act which would have resulted in a fine or a few weeks in prison. And yet allegedly using acceptable force to restrain him, three men would be charged with his murder. My name is Michael. I'm your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 226, Overkill. By the end of the day, three men would be charged with the Taj Mahal murder. Ali Mian, Ali Mokbul, and Abdul Suban. Having committed what many regard as one of society's most heinous crimes, you may assume that these three were all vicious, cruel, and remorseless killers. Only they weren't. As the temporary manager of Taj Mahal, Ali Ahmed Mian was born on the 6th of April 1935 in Datra, a small rural village in the Kamila district of what was then British India, now known as Pakistan. Being the fourth of five siblings to two elderly parents, and with his father said to be in his 90s, he was raised to be one of the family's breadwinners, and unlike his friends, he had the blessing of a good education. As farm labourers, many of the boys in the village were barely literate. But being intelligent and bright, up until the age of 23, Ali studied Bengali, English, civics and economics at college. And although he was partway through his degree, he had to quit his education so he could help out on his family's farm. 
and this was the way his life would be, putting his family first and himself second. By 1962, as a married man with two sons aged six and seven, although he was earning a decent wage as a clerk for the Water and Power Development Authority in Rangpur, both he, his wife and his children still lived as many men did with their elderly parents, but with his plan one day to move out. It was then that a golden opportunity appeared. On the 14th of June 1962, his company sent him from the newly formed country of Pakistan to the old and slightly creaky land of England, with a plan to research how the British utility companies worked. Britain on the cusp of the so-called swing in 60s must have been a real shock to his system. A mess of sex, drugs and sausage rolls. A population of long-haired men and short-skirted ladies, neither of whom wore enough clothes to keep warm in a sunless summer of perpetual drizzle and sometimes snow. All while eating, without doubt, the blandest and beigeous food he had ever seen in his life, which was so bad it had to be drenched in salt. Still pockmarked with Victorian slums, crumbling ruins, and the bomb sites from the Blitz, 1960s London was a fiery melting pot of different faces and voices. All fighting for space and the right to earn a decent living. As underneath was a tension of hostility, sirens, strikes, and what would be known as packy bashing. The city was a place of unease and disquiet. But for a man with a dream of a better life for his family, and with so many mouths to feed, London was a land of potential and promise, as well as peril and pain. Having arrived, he quickly terminated his contract with the company and went in search of work. And there lied the problem, as although well educated, his visa restricted him to just menial jobs and being described as thin and sparsely built. Ali wasn't physically equipped to be a bouncer or a laborer. So in September 1966, he started work as a waiter at the Taj Mahal Indian restaurant on Romilly Street. Ali Mian was a kind man, a good father, and to many, a loyal friend. And then on Saturday, the 23rd of June, 1968, along with two others, he was charged with murder. So where did it all go wrong? When did his life go rogue? His morals vanish. And fueled by drugs, a bad crowd led him down a path of doom and despair. Well, it didn't. Ali was just a regular man doing his job on an ordinary day when his life was changed forever. And the same was said of his two friends. Born in Mandrakra village in eastern Pakistan in 1941, Ali Mokbo was the only brother to two sisters and two half-sisters. And with his 65-year-old father paralyzed down his left-hand side, he needed to put a roof over their heads and food in their bellies. But not being an academic, his skill was cookery. In 1963, as a married man with two children, keen to provide them with a good life, Ali Mokbol came to London and working from the ground up 
He was a kitchen porter at the talk of the town, a cook at the Anglo Steakhouse, and he was later promoted to a cook at some of the West End's most affluent restaurants, like the Royal Garden Hotel, the Whitehall Court, and finally, at the Café Royale in Piccadilly. Earning a decent wage of £20 a week, he could have partied hearty and lived the high life, but focused on supporting his family. He worked late, he rarely went out, and rented out by the owner. He lived in a small and cramped room on the third floor above the Taj Mahal restaurant with his pal, Abdul Subban. Also born in Silat in eastern Pakistan, as a married man with four children, Subban met Mokbul when they both worked as lowly kitchen porters and dishwashers. And having been promoted to a butcher and a cook at the Royal Garden Hotel, they shared the five pounds a week rent. They lived humbly. And although they never worked at the Taj Mahal, they were both good friends with his temporary manager, Ali Meehan. As devoted Muslims, they didn't drink. As family men, they didn't cause trouble. As law-abiding citizens, they had never been arrested or even questioned. And keen to continue being hard-working people, they didn't break the rules, especially as Subban was applying for his British citizenship. Their story was typical of many workers from overseas who just wanted to do well. But for one man, this chance at change was an opportunity he would squander. Basha Mia was a 46-year-old unemployed wastrel and a petty thief who was described by the police as few people called him a friend short, stocky, and unpleasant. Like Ali, Mokbul, and Suban, although he also came from eastern Pakistan, neither of them knew him before the week of the murder. With his parents dead, and no known relatives still living in Pakistan, in 1947, 19-year-old Basha fled to England. And according to his wife Eileen, he hadn't worked a day in 20 years. Living off national assistance handouts, they drifted between council houses. And although they would have two children together, a daughter and a son, their 14-year-old boy was later placed into social care. With a lengthy criminal record and an aggressive streak, Basha was the kind of blight on society that the police often questioned, rounded up for lineups, and would turn a blind eye to if he got attacked. Within his first few months in the UK, he was sentenced to six months in prison for assault. In 1952, he served six months for armed robbery in ABH. In 1955, he served six weeks for stealing 15 cigarettes. In 1956, he served five years for armed robbery, but just three months after his release, he was back inside, serving another 21 months for robbery with violence. And so it went on, as like a foul whiff, he drifted between prisons, and being the epitome of a shitty, half-witted criminal without a single brain cell, he always got caught. Again, after his release. In 1962, he served two years for the theft of a radio, 30 months in 1964 for stealing a briefcase, and 14 days for stealing 13 fruit dishes, and six months for shoplifting, both in 1967. Which meant that, across his career, he'd spent more time in prison than out. 
which was a blessing for his wife. By April 1968, Basher and Eileen had moved into a dirty, unfurnished council flat at 300 Lewisham Road in Deptford, where he returned to after his release from prison. On the 11th of June 1968, just 11 days before his murder, he was sentenced to three months at Woolwich Magistrates Court for the charge of shoplifting. But with the magistrate, for whatever reason, being lenient on this repeat offender, his sentence was suspended and Basher went back to being a petty thief, a notorious pest and a violent thug who beat his wife. Basher wasn't the big-time gangster that he thought he was. As to those who had the displeasure of crossing his path, he was nothing but a petty thug and a pointless waste of space. A leech on society who would nick whatever wasn't nailed down and extort petty sums of money from hard-working persons. And as a notorious pest who never failed to annoy, one of the places he pestered and pilfered from was the Taj Mahal on Romilly Street. Basher was seen as little more than a nuisance, as according to Isaac the cook, he came in now and then for nothing, but sometimes he came to sell stolen items. Only now, he'd become very desperate. On Thursday the 20th of June, just two days prior, Ali Mokpol was lured out of his third floor lodging over the Taj Mahal by Basha Mir, supposedly to get some fresh air. Hailing a taxi, he didn't know where they were going or why, and neither was he introduced to the two stocky white males sitting either side of him. According to Mokpol, they drove for miles to somewhere unknown. Until suddenly stopping the taxi, he put a big knife to my throat and said, give me what you've got. What you got. They took his watch, two gold rings, including his wedding band, as well as the five pound note he had placed in an envelope to send to his wife and children. Mogbul didn't report the robbery to the police, as he didn't want to risk his job and his visa. But they all knew one thing for certain, that like a bad smell, Basher would be back. Saturday the 22nd of June was a day which began as ordinary as any other. Being a little after 5 p.m., the Taj Mahal on Romilly Street was ghostly quiet, except for Isaac preparing the food in the basement kitchen, Ali in the manager's office organizing the cash float for the night's business, and three floors above, connected by a single stairwell. Mogbul and Suban were in their bedroom, resting between shifts. According to their statements, the incident was as unremarkable as any Saturday night in Soho. Ali stated, I was about to open. I looked towards the counter and I saw a man pick up my cash box and begin to make off with it. The man was Bashamian and the cash box held just three pounds or 50 pounds today. But with Ali being the manager and the money belonging to the business, the responsibility was his. Like any decent person, Ali said, I ran after him and jumped on his back. I shouted for help 
screaming, Come quick, he's taking my money. And hearing his cries, Mokbul and Subban race down to see this small-time petty thief trapped. In his left hand, the cash box. As in his right hand, a terrifyingly large knife, which he thrust like a striking cobra, into Ali's petrified face. Hissing with venom, I'm going to kill you. Approaching stealthily from behind, Subban said, I grabbed his right wrist, swung him around, and we both fell to the ground. Mr. Ahmed and Mr. Mokbul assisted me to overpower him. And with Basha's manner, described as aggressive and extremely violent, we kept him there until the police came. With the call logged at 5.38 p.m., P.C. Wright arrived at the Taj Mahal restaurant at 21 Romilly Street to the report that the manager and two others had detained a man for the larceny of cash from a till. And that was it. A petty thief and a local pest had failed to steal three pounds in loose change. He was cornered, restrained, and receiving a few minor cuts and bruises to his face, hands and neck. With the room speckled with a few shards of a broken wine glass which broke in the struggle, the staff were questioned, and with Basha unable or unwilling to respond to the police's questions, he was taken to hospital for tests. This so-called incident was so uneventful that with the restaurant late opening and the theatre crowd already queuing up outside, Isaac the cook would claim, I went into the kitchen and lit the gas rings. As to those who were there that night, this was nothing that they hadn't witnessed many times before. Only this night was about to turn deadly. Taken to Charing Cross Hospital, Dr. Dupre, the casualty officer, stated, He was semi-conscious, and he complained about a pain in his leg and difficulty breathing. On initial assessment, his injuries were consistent with restraint, but also a beating. He had bruising to his neck, grazes down his shins and knuckles, a black eye, a cut to his lip, and a circular wound which looked like a bite mark. And suspecting a fractured skull and possible broken ribs, he was given two x-rays. But having deteriorated fast, and with his heart having stopped, at 7.20pm, Bashamir was declared dead. And with that, all three men, Ali, Mokbol and Suban, were charged with his murder. Interviewed at West End Central Police Station by Detective Inspector George Chandler, together they had explained how they had caught and restrained him, how he had threatened them and struggled. But interviewed separately, Suddenly the story fell apart, and a different tale began to be told. Upon arrival at the Taj Mahal, PCs Wright and Moore spotted that things were not as they seemed. We were shown into a small, poorly lit back room. On the floor, a man was lying on his right side in a semi-prone position. There were bloodstains on his shirt. He had a deep cut on his upper lip from which blood was flowing, and he had bruises and reddening about the face. Asked what had happened, the constables were told, We overpowered him and held him down until you arrived. Nothing more. 
But when asked by the officers, who tied his wrists and ankles in front of him with a rope, they all denied this. And according to P.C. Higgins, the Indians were all jabbering loudly, as if shielded by their own language, they were deciding which story to tell. Isaac confirmed that at 5.35 p.m., seeing all three men struggling with Basha, they said, we've caught a thief, and I helped them drag him into a small room. And although unproven, not one of them could explain the reason why they dragged him from the hallway to a small secluded office behind the restaurant. When interviewed, their recollections of the night were vague to say the least. When asked, was Basha tied up? Separately, they replied, I don't know. Nobody tied him up. I didn't see that. When asked, did anyone punch or kick him? Mokbul said, I didn't kick him. I only tried to lift him. Subban admitted, I punched him once or twice, but he denied that anyone else did. And although their statements varied between how many men were fighting, whether three, two, one, or even none, Subban blamed Isaac the cook, but Isaac denied this. And although the full extent of the injuries which ended Bash's life were yet to be revealed, when asked, did you see anyone jumping on him? Separately, they would all agree that they hadn't, contradicting the evidence of the autopsy. Conducted by Professor Keith Simpson at the Westminster Public Mortuary at 10.30 a.m. the next morning. With the scuffs, grazes and abrasions set aside, although a fracture ran from the side of Basher's skull into his right eye socket, his death was not caused by a brain hemorrhage or exacerbated by disease. It was the bruising to the chest which drew the pathologist's attention, as there were no external injuries to the front, where the victim's wrists and ankles had been tied with rope, but only to the back. And although all three men had denied kicking Basher and jumping on him, both of his shoulder blades were fractured. His back was a patchwork of black bruises and purple swollen lumps, covering an area from his neck to his hips. X-rays had proven that his cheekbones had shattered and that his right eye had ruptured. But also, underneath several flat wounds, which bore the unmistakable outline of shoed feet, something akin to the weight of a man had repeatedly jumped and pummeled up and down, squarely on his back. Fracturing his shoulder blades and his breastbone, that force had snapped 21 of his 24 ribs like they were dry twigs, as his whole chest cavity buckled in. With nothing to protect his internal organs, and these bones as sharp as glass shards. His diaphragm and his spleen ripped apart. Both lungs were crushed. And as the life-giving air leaked out of his flattened chest, his body filled with blood, suffocating his heart and his brain. Charged with murder on Sunday the 23rd of June 1968, Ali Ahmed Mia, Ali Mokbo and Abdul Subban gave statements. 
and all agreed to have their clothes, fingerprints and blood samples taken. Held at Brixton Prison, all three gave a good account of the incident, knew the nature of the crime and were capable of knowing that the acts were wrong. So therefore, they were declared fit to stand trial. With the prosecution laying out the evidence against them, uniquely for a murder trial such as this, where with no independent witnesses, it was impossible to determine who had inflicted what injuries. Each man had a different blood group. Basha was O, Ali was A, Subban was O negative, and Mokbal was B. But with no blood found on either of their clothes, and the accused sticking to their story that they had struggled and restrained a violent thief who was holding a knife. Mr. Justice Paul declared, In view of the evidence, it would be unsafe to ask the jury to convict. In those circumstances, I will take the responsibility of directing them to find the defendants not guilty. Cleared of all charges, not GBH, not ABH, or even manslaughter, all three men walked from the court. But were they innocent of a crime? Did they use appropriate force? Was this a case of overkill, which the investigation couldn't prove? Or were the police given a tough choice? To convict three decent, hard-working men who were pushed to their limit? Or to bring justice to a petty thief who they knew no one would miss? hat off there we go you're probably hot hot wearing that hat oh cripes it's a hot day today it's a very hot day today oh we're in the middle of our, our heat wave it's a it's a shit heat wave when you look at everyone else and their heat waves like like you know sister in america is like 40 plus degrees like plus 100 in their currency uh for three months almost solid and we're grumbling because we've had we've had a, a couple of days, a couple of days where it's been above thirty. Ooh, remember last year when it was bloody horrible? Yeah, not not terrible this year, not terrible this year. But sitting inside recording, it's bloody hot. Let me let me just open up a window. We'll crack open a window. I've actually got ooh uh, my back door open. Ooh uh, not like that. Ooh uh, misses. Um, so I'm just gonna open. Oh. I got my have my pillows in front of the windows to try and add a bit of protection for sound because those bastards in their helicopters are out today. Bastards! Not as bad as it will be when I'm near I'm near the mini airport, the twat airport as I like to call it, where they all hang out and go, eh, oh, my little aircraft, eh, check me out. Eh. So uh, yeah, the bastards that they are. So oh oh, what else is going on? Uh, I'm on my third. <coughs> <coughs> oh, I'm coughing. Ugh. Oh, that's better. I'm on my third watch now. Really annoying. I, I buy these little watches that I like. Uh, do you know your pedo meter? Because I like to keep on target. I'm doing really good. I'm on. Uh, I'm on uh, six hundred thousand steps a month at the moment, which I worked out the other week uh, is uh, the equivalent of walking from London to Baghdad. So there you go. That's. Um, I try to keep my steps up to keep my keep. My, keep my health good but also keep the flab away Eva said I was too fat so I had to lose weight uh until until we get to winter and then she'll want me to fatten up so she's she she likes to use me to put my put her feet into my flab and then I keep her feet warm but you know when I'm when I'm where I should be at her feet um but yeah no the third strap has broken literally I just nudged it against the door and it, str it fell off and every time you take your your watch to one of these repair shops like Timson's or something they always go they go yeah we repair watch straps and then they open up their little box of watch straps and you go yeah that's 
that's ladies half relatively posh straps like the little thin um posh uh, leather ones with ornate i i just want one of these shitty plastic silicon ones for, for a man's sports watch and they go, oh we haven't got those we got one of these this is 15 quid and you put them in and it breaks within seconds which is very annoying anyway well oh, there you go a, a little ramble about something uh good news oh this is very exciting uh, I don't know when this was decided, but we've, as boaters, because I'm a boater and I live on the waterway and uh, uh, I'm, I, I, I don't have a permanent mooring, so I move around a lot. We've just been given a £600 winter fuel allowance. I know, amazing. So we never get anything like that. We never get given anything because we're, we're the forgotten people. Boo. But yeah, no, it's just come through. I thought it was a con, but it's not. It's just arrived which is great, even though they don't know that because I'm Scots-Irish, I can't, basically I spend my whole year wearing shorts. And like even in winter, I have the doors open, the windows open, so I barely have the fire on. So like six, I won't spend 600 quid. So what I've, I'm going to do is use it to pay my river license for the year, which has gone up by 15%. Utter bastards, utter bastards. Everyone's price is going up. Yeah, utter bastards. Uh, I was doing my taxes the other week. This is very exciting, Michael, telling everyone about your taxes. And over the course of the year, because I use the same coffee shops a lot, it's amazing how like a cup of coffee in the same coffee shop has gone from like 3.20 up until 4.10. And you just go, but it's barely a year, barely a year. And it's got, it's, it's gone up by 25%. You just, that's, that's a bit piss bad, isn't it? Piss bad. Uh, like Murder Mile mugs have never gone up in price. Even when I used to do my walking tours, they never went up in price. I never increased them at any point. I kept them at the same value, always a good value. And I think for eight years, they, they remained £15. Uh, my tea is almost done. I'm going to grab my tea. Oh, and as always, no cake. I'm trying to be good. Eva said no cake. Uh, I did, although I did have a, a bit of a cake the other day. Just very, oh, my herbal tea fingers. There we go, it's done. Um, I did have a, a cake the other day. I treated myself because I have my treat days, which is a Saturday. <gasps> What's today? Hang on. What's today? What day is it today? What day is it? Oh, <gasps> crisis week has gone fast. Today is Friday, Friday the 8th of September. That means tomorrow is treat day. Yeah, get in, get in my big fat belly. Get that food in there. Um, only The only problem is the guy, I won't say which Tesco's it is, but uh, the guy who, who I saw the other week, who's the guy who fills up the freezer section, doesn't seem to do a very good job. Or whoever orders the food doesn't do a good job because the freezer section is always empty. Ugh. So there was no ice cream there. So I I ended up having to buy some Magnum ice creams, which were fine. But by the time I walked them home, they'd gone. Do you know, if you buy a nice pot of ice cream, it stays colder for longer. You can hold it for like an, an hour, whatever, without putting it in the fridge. But those Magnums, like half a second, uh, and then they're like, oh, it's, it's too hot. Oh, I'm melting, I'm melting. So yeah, they weren't, they weren't that nice. So I'm hoping he's done his bloody job properly and I can go and get some nice that nice swedish glass ice cream the vegan ice cream which is very nice there's this i think it's a raspberry one which is good so i'm gonna try that i like simple ice creams i don't like this fancy shit i don't see the point in the fancy shit it's just like, it's like one mouthful it's like yeah yeah that was fine second mouthful bored it's like pizza but most boring food in the world i never understand things that have no texture and one flavor like people who go to, go to, uh, na I'm off to Nando's, I'm off to Nando's, I'm going to get me some uh, Peri Peri chicken. It's like, it's one flavour. It's like, oh, first mouthful, lovely. Second mouthful, boring. Third mouthful, it's a chore. Pizza's the same. I love, if I owned a pizza restaurant, I would have multiple flavours on there, different ones. Oh, they're saying that I did, I don't know whether I mentioned this last week, I did have a couple of bites, and then I polished off a two-foot pizza all by myself, which had a ch uh, kebab meat on it. I didn't even remember it going into my belly, and I think my belly must have dissolved it quickly, because it didn't, I was expecting a bit of a, a bit of a problem in the morning. It just didn't, 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 you know, didn't. I didn't have to light bulb it out of my arsehole. That's what I'm saying. Right, let's... Uh, uh, thank you to new patron subscriber. So thank you to Laura Ferguson. Thank you, Laura. You are a new patron subscriber. I hope you're enjoying all the, the new goodies, all the, all the 
lots of goodies that are on there all the crime scene photos and all the extra stuff that i never share anywhere else so um i hope you enjoyed that don't forget folks if you want to be a patron subscriber you can do it's something like three dollars a month or which i think is uh two like like just over two pounds in real money and you get a lot for that i try and make sure that you get a lot but there's different tiers as well so there's lots of lots of fun things and there's a, there's a competition every week and uh, you get to win goodies um so oh and a thank you to ali m so ali very kindly sent through a donation via the supporter link uh so thank you very much for that ali that 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 has been spent on carrots not cake carrots sorry about that um uh, thank you to those who do uh, send uh, uh, the, the, if you want to support the show but without joining patreon but you want to do a donation you don't have to uh, but if you if you did want to um you can do it through the website uh there's a link on my website uh, the supporter link is already a pre-done via acast that goes through there but they never send you an email they never send me an email to say you've received a donation it's uh, suddenly you just go oh i should check it and then you look and you go oh shit there's donations and i forgot to check whereas if you do it through my website there's a, a thing that says donate uh I, email comes straight to me and then you get a personal reply for me as well i always make sure i do that but with supporter unfortunately they don't send us your email so therefore i can't contact you to say thank you so this is the only way i can do it and it's normally late as well oh is there anything else i can't rant about today let's find out uh, so let's do some quiz questions don't forget i haven't edited this episode yet so we don't know uh what bits i might take out i don't think i'll take out much of this one because it's i think it's under it was about 30 minutes so that's about right uh, so here we go question number one what is the name of the restaurant currently at 21 romilly street i've oh, got some what's it i might have in a bit mm. question number two uh, name two of the four subjects that ali studied when he was at college uh, question number three how long had ali worked at the taj mahal Question number four, how many children did these three men have between them? A bit of maths for you there, there you go. Uh, question number five, where did Subin and Mokbul first meet? Question number six, what was the name of, of Basha's wife? Question number seven, in 1955, Basha served six weeks in prison for stealing 15 what? Question number eight. What other two items do we know that he was convicted of stealing? Question number nine. What street did Basher and his wife live on? And question number ten. How much was in the cash box that he stole? So uh, let's dive into the details for this. Da, 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 da. I'm looking forward to going for a bit. Of, is, do I want to go for what? I, I've got to go to the coffee shop today. Coffee shop, as my grandma would say. But um, it's one of those days where even though this is a heat wave, it's entirely clouded over. So it's really muggy today. And you could feel it yesterday. Everyone was like, oh, the sun's out. But fucking hell, it's muggy. It's like because it's been wet everywhere for ages. And now, now the heat has just gone, right, let's go and make it muggy. And let's bring out all the little annoying little um, uh, mosquitoes, little bastards that they are. Um, so let's dive into the details. We, we know, uh, let's let's go forwards in time a bit. Bear with, bear with, bear with, and then we go backwards because we do have their original statements, and their original statements are really interesting. So um, this is what, kind of what I found interesting about this case was, um, even though the evidence said one thing, you've got their statements, and they're the only witnesses to this scene that said another. Th thing so they it was all very vague about it um no let's not forget as well even though they uh ali spoke relatively good english uh the other two didn't speak english that well it was a bit it was a bit broken therefore all of these are done through translators um so ali said uh, on saturday the 22nd of june 1968 at about 5 30 p.m i was in my restaurant about to open up i looked towards the counter and saw a man pick up my cash box and begin to make off with it i ran after him and jumped on his back i shouted for help and two of my friends came to my assistance the man uh, then took out a knife and waved it threatening us 
a fight broke out and between us we managed to get the knife away i told my friends uh to call the police the man was struggling all the time we finally managed to overpower him and to keep him on the floor until the police arrived so that is the first statement it's short uh ali mockball's one so oh, in this episode as well you'll notice that i call one of the guys by his first name and the other two by their surnames that's only because the, of the three guys they're called ali ali and abdul and i thought if i call them ali ali and abdul throughout you're going to go which which ali and which abdul and don't forget that um <laughs> um ali uh ali proper ali the manager ali his middle name is ahmed as well so it just made everything really complicated. So I made the decision to call the manager Ali and then the other two Mokbul and Suban using their surnames. So there you go. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Ali Mokbul said, uh, I was in my room on the second floor. He's actually the third floor. Uh, when I heard lots of shouting downstairs, I ran downstairs and saw Mr. Ahmed. This is where it gets complicated because he refers to Ali, other Ali as Mr. Ahmed, but his name's not Mr. Ahmed. Uh, the manager and Mr. Suban, together with another man who had a cash box in one hand and a knife in the other, which he was using to threaten Mr. Ahmed and Mr. Suban. Um, the man with the knife said, I'm going to kill you. A fight then started between Mr. Ahmed, Mr. Suban and the man with the knife and myself. We managed to get the cash box and the knife off him uh, with great difficulty, only with enough force to get the knife off him. The man fell to the floor and we managed to keep him there until the police arrived. Um, so again, incredibly vague. Uh... Abdul Subban said I was in my flat I heard a voice I recognised that of Mr Ahmed shouting come quickly he's taking my money I rushed downstairs and saw in the corridor Mr Ahmed who was confronted by a man who I now know to be Mr Basha Mia uh, under the left arm of the man was the cash box belonged to Mr Ahmed in the right hand he was holding a knife which he was brandishing in the face of Mr Ahmed Mr Mia was shouting come any closer and I'll kill you I approached him from behind, I grabbed his right wrist with my left hand, swung him around, grabbed his jacket with my right hand. Uh, we both fell to the ground and Mr. Ahmed and Mr. Mokbul assisted me to overpower him, take the knife from him and keep him on the floor. I then telephoned the police who arrived soon. Uh, Mr. Mia's manner towards Mr. Ahmed was one of extreme aggression and during the struggle he was extremely violent. Um, the only other witness we have there is uh, Isaac Mia, not related, uh, who was the cook in the basement. Um, basically, he'd come down from his room upstairs. Uh, he'd saw that there was a bit of a struggle going on. He said he didn't hear anything. He saw a struggle going on. It seemed to be under control. He went down to uh, the kitchen and put on the gas to uh, do the cooking. Um, so they're the only other witnesses we have there and that's their statement and that's the problem with this is that it doesn't match up to any of the facts there so um what do we do um with this there's almost they're, they're constantly referencing the fact that he's holding a knife he's saying i'm going to kill you he's being very threatening and aggressive but in all of their statements they it, they they seem to be uh, unable to remember things. Do you know, uh, the, the, like briefly in there, you saw that they, they said a, a fight, but that was just it, a fight, a struggle. Uh, we managed to get the knife off him. We, we held him onto the ground until the police arrived. But there's no reference of kicking, of punching, of jumping on him, of stamping on him, which is uh, what the evidence would suggest. Obviously, you've got to be relatively careful here because they were uh, acquitted in court which is not to say that they were innocent but just to say there wasn't enough evidence to to try them uh on the grounds of uh that obviously you've got to be uh found guilty but without a shadow of a doubt and in this case there was enough doubt from the judge to say i'm not going to put this forward to the jury because the jury literally um won't be able to won't be able to um make a proper decision on the, of this which is interesting because it had already gone to committal it already gone to committal at bow street magistrate court and the purpose of committal is to decide whether it is going to be committed to court that's the point purpose of a committal hearing um and therefore the magistrate and the or the judge as it would have been at the committal hearing made the decision that yes there was enough evidence for this to go forward but at the um 
at the trial at the Old Bailey was decided different. So, um, in in the statements you would have seen in there, that uh, one of them did blame Isaac Mia, the cook who was from da- uh, who was downstairs. They said, uh, I mean, even he said, um, his, he was going from the kitchen to his uh, going to the kitchen from his room, which was upstairs. He said, I did not hear any screams. Uh, I saw all three men struggling with Basha Mia. I asked them what the matter was. They replied, we caught a thief. Uh, and I was with them dragging Basha Mia into the small room. I went into the kitchen and lit all the gas. And then I came upstairs and found the police had arrived. Um, he states throughout, I did not take part in the fighting. And he says that he didn't, pretty much doesn't see anything. And that's what everyone else says as well. So even when uh, the detective chief inspector, detective inspector said, uh, the man was tied up when the police arrived. How do you account for that? And Armand, Armand said, I can't say. And they all say the same. Um, PC John Moore, who was one of the detectives, uh, one of the police who turned up in wireless car, Charlie 2, uh, with PC James Davidson and PC Higgins, uh, they arrived about about 20 minutes later uh said uh we were shown into a small back room poorly lit and on the floor was a man lying on his right hand side in a semi-prone position with his wrists and ankles tied together with a single piece of rope uh, the rope was found at the scene that was used as evidence uh, the clothes were disarranged and there were blood stains on his shirt he had a fairly deep cut to his upper lip from which blood was flowing he also had bruises and reddening about the face uh, PC Davidson untied the rope. PC Higgins called for an ambulance and then went to another small room uh, adjacent to the other and asked what happened. Uh, he spoke to Ahmed, uh, spoke to Ali, uh, who said, The man you saw lying on the floor came in here and took the cash box. He was running out. I jumped on his back and shouted for help. Some of my friends came to my assistance and then he took out a knife and was waving it at us. We managed to overpower him and held him down on the ground until you arrived. Um, it, it's, it was hard for the police when they turned up to see that and it, it very much looked like a struggle had taken place. Uh, they said his clothes were disarranged, his trousers were undone and half of his buttocks were hanging out not to suggest that there was anything rude going on his face was bloody and blood was coming from his mouth i found a jacket on the floor of the room which belonged to the injured man as well as a pair of sunglasses the left eyepiece was missing uh, for some reason basher always seemed to be wearing sunglasses even indoors so i don't know whether he was um whether he had a kind of an illness or whether he thought he um he was he was cool like a hip cat do you know hip cat cool man um there you go just made myself sound uh old uh pc higgins said the indians were jabbering loudly which is a very bit of a racist statement to stay there um but uh, because none of the men who turned up there none of the officers who turned up there spoke um the language or dialect that any of the three men do they, they had no idea what they were saying so it was suspected at that point he um uh, they were probably trying to come up with a, a coherent story. Um, Dr. John Dupre was the resident casualty officer at Charing Cross Hospital. Uh, the body, the body, um, Basher arrived at 6.20 p.m. accompanied by PC Mays. He said on arrival, he was semi-conscious and complained of difficulty in breathing and a pain in his leg. He was very shocked. He had no pulse. Uh, well, he, he had little pulse, not no pulse. If he had no pulse, he'd be dead. Uh, he had no pulse and very low blood pressure. Injuries were listed as a lot of bruising on his back, which appeared to have been caused by kicking many times. Grazes down the front of his shins. On the left shoulder, there was a quarter inch round puncture wound surrounded by a bruise, which had the appearance of a bite, as well as cuts uh cuts uh, grazes to knuckles swelling to the left temple a left black eye a half inch cut to his upper right lip an obvious fracture to the skull and he had broken most of his ribs uh, damaged both lungs and probably his heart all this damage had been caused by the injuries to the back of the chest as there were no internal external injuries to the front of the chest um so as explained in the episode they hog tied him to the front with his hands and uh wrists and ankles to the front but then 
it's suggested that they kicked him and that they jumped on him. Uh, so, so with his hands tied, he's unable to defend himself. Um, it was only because they were uh, Di Chandler was interviewing both men, all three men in different rooms, uh, one after the other, um, over the night that uh, all these details started coming together, and they started realizing that there was just their story just didn't match up, especially when they got the um, the autopsy report, which which was the next day. They'd already got some details from Doctor Dupre that um, it was suspected that this man had been attacked, he'd been kicked and probably jumped on. Uh, <coughs> but uh, it wasn't until that the uh, autopsy report came through that they were able to conclude a lot more and uh, and also the death of Basha as well. Uh, what else have we got on here? As mentioned with, with, uh, with uh, how he got injured, uh, the DI, the DI said the doctor at the hospital said Basher had some very serious injuries. Uh, there was no reply to that. Do you know how these injuries were caused? Ahmed said, I can't say. The DI said, did you see anyone else kick this man or jump on him? Ahmed said, I can't say. DI said, did you tie up, uh, tie him up to stop him escaping? Uh, Ahmed said, no. Um, it's, it's very confusing without the, or the, there's they they all stuck to their story, but all these little details were kind of uh, made it made it really kind of difficult to get to to, to tell a consistent story. Um, Mogwell said, "I only helped him sit up when the man was on the floor." Um, Di said, "Did you kick or jump on the man?" Mogwell said, "No, I did not kick. I only tried to lift him up." Di said, "Did you see anyone else kick or jump on him?" Mogwell said, "No." Di said, "Did you help tie up this man?" Mokbul said, "I told Ahmed to tie him up." Uh, Di said, "Did Ahmed tie him up?" Mokbul said, "Nobody tied him up." So there you go. That that's the way it went throughout. Very inconsistent on all these stories. Do you know, um, the Di said, "Did uh, you see anyone kick or jump on Basha?" Subin said, "No, I didn't see anyone jumping, but I punched him once or twice," which goes against what everyone else said. Did anyone else punch him? Subin said, I didn't see anyone, which is amazing. You've got four people in a room, a small room, and they didn't see things. Uh, was Basha tied up with a rope? Subin said, nobody tied him up. Well, he was tied up. Uh, Di said, when the police arrived, they found him tied up. Subin said, I didn't see that. Di said, well, the doctor said Basha was seriously injured. How can you ca account for these injuries? Subin said, I only hit him with a hand. Di said, "How many people took part in the fight?" Subin said, "One man came from the kitchen. That would be uh, Isak Mir." Uh, Di said, "What did he do?" And Subin said, "I did not notice." So that's the way it kind of went through throughout. Uh, with uh, the, the investigation into this, obviously you've got the blood samples. So uh, Basher's blood sample, as mentioned, was Group O uh, MN, which is uh, twenty-three of the population. Three percent of the population have that, and that's mostly. Uh, people coming from uh, a specific area of India. Uh, Ali Mokbul was Group B, which is only 2% of the population. Subin uh, O negative, 10% of the population. And Ali Ahmed Mir, who's the manager, Group AM, which is only 12% of the population. So you've got all these people with really rare groups and all different as well. Um, obviously, when the police arrived, uh, because the incident has literally just happened, the men were taken into custody and all of their clothes were taken. So uh, Basher's tie, pullover, trousers, shirt, jacket, shoes and scarf. He was wearing a scarf even though it was the highest summer. Um, or they also had the bloke, a broken glass ashtray, a broken wine glass, glass on the carpet, which were all stained with Basher's blood. Uh, Basher's blood was found on the table, uh, the wall, the carpet... Uh, and although they had everyone else's clothes, uh, including uh, black shoes, a blue shirt and gold trousers. Gold trousers. There we go. It's a bit, bit excessive. Uh, Bash's, clo Bash's blood was found everywhere except on the three men's clothes. So Mukbul, uh, Ali Ahmed and uh, Subban, all of their clothes... And it was uh, Mokbul who had the gold trousers. Very nice. Uh, no blood was found on any of their clothes at all. No, no specks. They, had, they hadn't gone away and cleaned their clothes. The police had literally turned up afterwards. Um, 
Autopsy conducted by Professor Keith Simpson at uh, Westminster Public Mortuary at 10.30 a.m. the next morning. Um, the body was identified by uh, Bash's wife. Her name I won't mention because that is one of the questions. Uh, he had no signs of disease, no suggestion of drink, even though blood samples were taken. Um, no visible brain injury. A fracture to the skull running into the right eye socket. Socket, ex very extensive and heavy bruising to each side of the chest, over the shoulder blades and spine. 21 ribs had been fractured. Uh, the breastbone was fractured. The whole chest cage had buckled in. Both lungs were crushed. The right lung uh, penetrated, causing a hemorrhage and the escape of air into the right chest cavity, collapsing the lung and bleeding into both lungs, filling the air passages. Um... So pretty horrific, that pretty horrific way to die. And if you think about it, he took him almost two hours to die. So that's uh, that's pretty horrible. Uh, when they were charged at Western Central Police Station, because all three men were uh, under not only a solicitor but also an interpreter as well. Um, uh, Subin was advised by his solicitor to say nothing at that point. All three men agreed to be examined by a police doctor. Their fingerprints and blood samples were taken, as well as their clothes. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the following Monday, they were they were committed to Bow Street Magistrates Court. Um, and therefore, it was decided that, that there was enough evidence to take this to criminal conviction or criminal court. Um, held at Brixton Prison. Uh, there was no evidence of mental illness. They all gave a good account of the incident. Uh, they knew the nature of the crime and they were determined fit to stand trial. Um, and I think that is it. I think that was it. It wasn't a massively lengthy file. It was only, I think it was only like about 120 pages, which is, in, which is enough. But um, I, think, I think I wrote a lot more originally of all these details. Do I have anything else? Do I have anything else? No, I think we've pretty much covered anything. And I don't think I'm going to edit out much out of this. So I think, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's it. Yep, yeah, that's me done. So let's do the quiz questions. Let's do those quiz questions and see how many you get. No prize, except except pride, of course, uh, on how many you get. So question number one, what was the name of the restaurant which currently stands at 21 Romilly Street? It's called Gaultier. Question number two. Name two of the four subjects that Ali studied at college. He studied Bengali, English, civics and economics. Question number three. How long had Ali worked at the Taj Mahal? In total, he was in the England for six years, but he'd worked at the Taj Mahal for two years. Uh, question number four, how many children did these three men have between them? It was seven. So Ali had two, Mugbal had two, Subban had four. Question number five, where did Subban and Mugbal first meet? It was when they were kitchen porters at the talk of the town. You win that one if you just say kitchen porters. Burpees. Uh, question number six, what was the name of Basher's wife? It was Oh, hiccup now. Eileen? Oh, no, no. Oh, question number seven. In 1955, Basher served six weeks in prison for stealing 15 what? Cigarettes. Uh, question number eight. What other two items do we know he was convicted of stealing? It was a radio and a briefcase. Uh, there's also, I just remembered, some fruit dishes as well. So if you said fruit dishes, you win that one. Uh, question number nine. What street did Basher and his wife live on? It was Lewisham Road in Deptford. And question number ten. How much money was in the cash box? It was three pounds or fifty pounds today. <sighs> there we go, folks. Oh, big old yawn. And that's me done. Uh, so thanks for... Ugh, I've just lost the will to live. Thanks for uh, listening to that episode. That's very much appreciated. I uh, hope you're all having a good week and staying safe and well. And uh, we'll be back next week with uh, another one-parter. Hope you're all having a good time. Uh, best wishes. Lots of love, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>